We're now going to go on to looking at aqueous solutions. So aqueous solutions require us to look at water because water is our universal solvent. So whenever we're typically considering solubility or anything that's dissolved in a solvent, we're typically looking at water because water dissolves most polar um, solutes. And so water is a bent triatomic molecule, which we looked at before. And so this means um, that it's got its um, lone pair at the top and we know that it has two highly polar um, covalent O to H bonds. And so this means that water has a very strong net dipole and means that it can participate in three different hydrogen bonds. So it can participate in a hydrogen bond from the oxygen molecule where the electrons are centered to, or it can participate in hydrogen bonding from either of the hydrogen atoms um, where the protons are centered to. And so we can see that down this bottom left diagram here, where we can see these hydrogen bonds forming this web-like structure um, due to the attractions. And so the high boiling point of water compared to molecule size and its unique density and surface tension properties are gonna be due to this structure. So surface tension is referring to where we have this hydrogen bond web-like structure and it provides a tensile surface in which stuff can balance along, such as when you see a leaf floating along water, that is due to surface tension. And so when we're considering water, we can see that water has a very high boiling point, a very high melting point in comparison to other substances, despite those other substances having a larger molar mass. So for example, we've got H2O has its molar mass of 18 and its melting point is zero and boiling point is 100 degrees. Um, but if we consider something like our next molecule down, we've got a molar mass of 20. And so a molar mass of 20, we would assume it's a bigger molecule, it's gonna have stronger intermolecular forces. However, this is just a single atom, so it actually has a very low melting point and a very, very low boiling point. And so in comparison with water's very, very strong, um, very, very strong intermolecular forces with the hydrogen bonds, it's got a much higher melting point and boiling point. We can then consider something like methanol, which has its molar mass of 32. And so we can see methanol has a hydrogen bond because of that O to H. Um, and it has a lot larger molar mass, so it's also going to have larger dispersion forces. However, it has a much lower melting point and a much lower boiling point than water. And this is because water has two locations of hydrogen bonds, whereas methanol only has one location of a hydrogen bond. And so this means that the water molecules can be more attracted to each other then methanol molecules can be attracted to each other. And so this means that there is going to be harder to break apart those water molecules. So there'll be a higher melting point and subsequently a higher boiling point. So when we consider solvation in an aqueous solution, solvation is the process where we're going to be dissolving it. So the solvent is the most abundant of the substances in a solution. So when we're considering a sodium chloride solution, we will have more sodium chloride um, and it will be the most abundant typically in the solution. And so the solute will be dissolved in the solvent. So the solvent, for example, is the NaCl being dissolved the solute is the NaCl being dissolved in the water solvent. And so the same dynamic interactions that give water its properties are what enable it to be such a good solvent of polar substances. And so it will only be polar substances because it's like dissolves like. 
And so um, solvation is considered to be the process in which solvent molecules surround solute molecules and cause dissolution. So solvation is going to be uh, where we're having those water molecules break the intermolecular forces of those NaCl molecules and then reform intermolecular forces fully surrounding it. And so that's then the dissolution part. So dissolution is being underpinned by thermodynamics. So this is because we need to be able to break the solute to solute interactions in order to allow solvation to occur. So we will have some instances in which the solute to solute interaction is going to be so strong that it cannot become by be overcome by solvation. So if we have a very if we have a molecule with extremely strong intermolecular forces, those intermolecular forces will not be able to be broken apart such that it then won't allow for um, for the solubility to occur and the sol solvation to occur because it won't be able to be intermixed with the water solute, uh, with this water solvent. And so that would only typically be if the um, particular solute which was being dissolved in the water solvent um, had stronger intermolecular forces than that of the water. But because water has such strong intermolecular forces, it's very difficult for there to be a solute in which it has stronger intermolecular forces than water, because water is used as our universal solvent for that particular reason. So typically that doesn't tend to occur. And so when we're considering aqueous solutions, we also need to consider the mole concept. And so this is relating the mass, number of molecules, molar mass, and number of molecules in solution to describe aqueous solutions. And so the sum of the molar masses of all atoms in a substance um, can be used to determine the molecular or formula mass. And so one mole of the quantity, uh, one mole is going to equal the quantity of a given substance that contains an equal number of molecules as 12 grams of carbon 12. And so carbon 12 is like our um, measurement point. It's our standpoint where we use that to determine um, moles, basically. And so... Um, Carbon-12 has 6.02214 times 10 to the power of 23 um, mole, like molecules we consider. And so that's talking about like relating back almost to Avogadro's number. And so it's the quantity of any given substance that's going to contain an equal number of molecules as that 12 grams of that particular carbon-12. And so we can then apply this to this formula which we have, which is molar mass equals mass over moles. Or otherwise known as um, moles equals mass over molar mass. And so we can also figure out molarity when we're, when we're doing aqueous solutions. Um, where we use molarity equals moles of solute divided by liters of solution. And so that's um, represented as C equals N over V. And so this is used to determine the concentration of a particular substance. So it's basically our concentration is equaling the number of the moles of the solute which we've put in to the solution divided by the total volume of the solution which we have. And so we also use this concept or this formula of C equals N over V. And so, I'm um, sorry, or C, no, sorry, C1 V1 equals C2 V2. And so this is used for dilutions. And so C1 and V1 are going to be characteristic of our starting solution 
whilst C2 and V2 are going to be characteristic of our finishing solution. And so this can be used, for example, if we're starting off with our solution of NaCl in water, and we know that we start off with um, a concentration of one molar and we have 10 mils of our solution. So we'd have one times by 10, and then we know that we're adding in, um, so we'd have one times by 0 0.01 because it's in liters. And then we know that we're adding in 100 mils of water. So we're gonna end up with 110 mils of solution. But we wanna determine how is that going to affect the concentration of the solution which we have because we know our solution which we currently have is one molar but how is that going to change when we add more water so we go 1 by 0 0.01 equals c2 times by 0 0.11 and so we can then rearrange this algebraically and determine um, our concentration and so we would divide it out and I'll just quickly do it on a calculator to give you an answer just for completion. So we'd have um, one times by um, 0 0.01 and then divided by um, 0 0.11. And so that gives us a finishing concentration or C2, which equals 0 0.091. So we'd say that our final volume, I'm oh sorry, our final concentration of this solution after we've added that volume of 100 mils to the initial solution is going to be 0 0.09 molar. So these are some common exam style questions which we typically see. Um, and so I've just got these here with some with a working out below, just so I can step you through these because I think it's really important to understand the foundations of how you figure these out and, um, and how the calculations should be structured. So first of all, we need to start off with what mass of CO2 is produced. Um, so the first question, like what mass of CO2 is produced by the combustion of one mole of CH4? So this is a really good starting question because um, it's very common to get exam style questions like these um, because they want to see that you can apply um, ratios and that you can apply that mass equals mol um, equals moles over molar mass. Oh, uh, sorry, moles times by molar mass. So that rearrangement of that formula. So in this question here, they've actually given you the um, the equation of the reaction and so that's really good often they won't do that but we can see here that um, the reaction which we have occurring here is we've got CH4 plus 2O2 is making carbon dioxide and water and so it's really important to note that we do have ratios in these so we need to see are the ratios something that we need to apply in this so we're looking at we're looking at CH4 to CO2, and we can see that those have a one-to-one -one ratio of CH4 to CO2. So we don't need to worry about any multiplications with these because they are a one-to-one -one ratio. So the only thing we need to consider for this is we know that we're putting in one mole of CH4. So because we maintain a one-to-one -one ratio, um, with that one-to-one -one ratio we can see that if we have one mole of CH4, we will produce one mole of CO2. So we want to calculate, if we know we're producing one mole of CH4, we want to see how does one mole of CH4 turn into a mass. So we can use mass equals moles times by molar mass. And so we know that the number of moles is one. So we can do one times by, and then the molar mass of carbon dioxide. 
and so we can use our periodic table for that. So we can find the molecular mass of carbon, which is 12, and then the molecular mass of oxygen, and there's two oxygens, uh, which is 16. So we've got 1 times by 12 plus 16 plus 16. And so that's going to give us an answer of 44, which means that there is 44 grams of carbon dioxide produced when we use, when we combust one mole of um, methane or one mole of CH4. Our next question, which we're going to look at, is how many moles of HCl can be produced from 0 0.226 grams of SOCl2. And so again, they've given us the equation here, but typically in an exam, they would tend to want you to write the equation yourself. Um, but the equation is always the first step if it's not written for you. And so that's SOCl2 plus H2O makes SO2 plus 2HCl. And so another thing we've got to do again is we've got to look at our ratios. So we can see we want to figure out how many moles of HCl can be produced from 0 0.226 grams of SOCl2. So we can see that there is a one to two ratio of HCl. So we've just got to take note of that for now. We'll come back to that because we've noticed that there is grams for SOCl2. And so we can't do a complete um, comparison with grams because grams are not a comparison comparable value um, when we're looking at chemical reactions because the gram the number of grams will change depending on what the substance is so we need to convert to moles and I think a good thing to remember is if in doubt convert to moles so if you don't know um, what's happening in the reaction and you don't know where to start I think that always the best thing to do is convert to moles because typically it will require moles in order for the reaction to be calculated. So we'll use the moles equals mass over molar mass formula. And so that's going to be our mass of 0 0.226 divided by the molar mass of SOCl2. So that being 32.1 plus 16 plus 35.5 plus 35.5. And so when we do that on a calculator, that gives us an answer of 0 0.0019 moles of SOCl2. And so now that we've got that value in moles, we can now use our ratio, which we talked about earlier. So remembering that we have a one to two ratio of SOCl2, to HCl and so that means that there is going to be double the number of moles of HCl produced that we started with of SOCl2. So that means we've got to do the 0 0.0019 moles of SOCl2 times by 2 which will give us 0 0.0038 moles of HCl. And so we know the number of moles um, that have been produced is 0 0.0038 moles of HCl. And so that's all that the question has asked us for. So we could leave the answer as that. And in an exam, I would say leave the answer as that. That's all you need to do. They've only asked you for moles. If they asked you for grams, though, we have the next part of the equation. And so we'll just do that off. Just, we'll just do that to finish it off and just for completion. Um, and so because typically in an exam, they will ask you to convert back to the um, units which you started with. And of course, the units which you started with were grams. So they typically want you to convert back to grams. So in order to convert back to grams, we'll use mass equals moles times by molar mass. And so that's going to equal our moles of HCl, so 0 0.0038, times by the molar mass of HCl. So that's going to be 1 plus 35.5. And so then that's going to give us 0 0.139 grams of HCl. And I think that's really important to note 
um, because that really shows how important it is to remember to convert to moles. Because remember, we started off with 0.226 grams of SOCl2, and we doubled that amount to, pro we produced double the amount in terms of HCl, but we've got a lot less, um, we've got 0.139 grams of HCl produced. So although we've got a 1 to 2 ratio of SOCl2 to HCl, we've actually got less um, quantity of HCl produced, but more moles of HCl produced.